that we need our fucking rock yeah, right and there, now. <laughs> yeah, and, and there is kind of like a like a reawakening of like you know a resurgence for original mm-hmm. modern rock. Mm-hmm. And like, I mean, that, I've it, seen it. What's that uh, band I heard? Like Greta Van Fleet. Yeah, the kids that sound like Led Zeppelin. Oh my god, I love it so much. Yeah, so damn good. Dude, I mean, they, they, they clean house. I mean, they've sold out, like, every venue they go to, and they're going to be at uh, the new at uh, Woodstock 50. Well, yeah. They, they do. They literally... When I, when I was listening to the radio, I didn't even know who the hell was on there. But I turned it up, and I was like, never heard this Zeppelin song before. I was like, yeah. I've, I've heard a lot of Zeppelin. What, what song is this? And, you know, you put on, like, the information part on your radio, and I'm like, what the fuck is a Greta Van Fleet? Oh, my God, a new <laughs> band that sounds like this? Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and it was like, oh, they're just like a Led Zeppelin cover. I'm like, just be happy that there's like a mainstream, like, you know, mm-hmm. like radio friendly rock band there's real musicians. made up of, of millennials who, like, you know, we get, I mean, because we get a lot of shit, it's like, oh, we're all about like prepackaged pop and hip hop, mm-hmm. and there's no imagination. It's all prepackaged, it's all done in the studio. These guys are playing real instruments. I mean, we have guitar solos, we have a kid up front who's like, what, 19, 20 years old, who sounds like Robert Plant, but, you know, they're not the first band to sound like Led Zeppelin before. Yeah, yeah. Because before, I mean, there was Rival Sons, and they sounded Led Zepp- like Led Zeppelin when they first came out, but then they have since evolved, mm-hmm. and they sound just like, you know, like a Rival Sons song. And the same's going to happen with them. I don't want them to change. No, keep sounding like that <laughs> 24-7, baby. All right, well, that's a hell of a way to get this done. <laughs> we'll pick up more on that. The hell with Gre- evolution. Gre- Greta Van Fleet. <laughs> Are they good? Are they not? Hot, hot takes. Hot takes. Right. <laughs> That'll so, be your next podcast. Hot takes right. with Tony Capobianco. So, we're, so that's a hell of a way to get this uh, episode kicked off. And I'm very happy on this episode to bring in one of my favorite people, Mr. Derek Moore. Thank you very much for having me, Tony. You got it. So obviously, there's so much to talk about. Uh, before we even got started, we were talking about uh, wrestling and how WrestleMania we- weekend, baby. Mm-hmm. And I'll, I mean, I'm gonna let you and everybody else know that I I'm not I've never fell into wrestling. I mean, when I first came into comedy, I found out that there are so many like hardcore wrestling fans, and I didn't understand it. I mean, like I got the fact that there are like fanboys out there, mm-hmm. but to have like a high concentration in the comedy world just blew my mind. I was just as blown away, dude. Like, I went most of my life being a wrestling fan and having, like, one friend growing up that I could talk about it with outside of my sister or my family. Uh, So, like, when I came into comedy and realized, like, how many people talked wrestling, it was like, I belong here! Yeah. (laughs) Now if I can just figure out how to be funny. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I mean, priority, of course. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm like, watching, oh, like, people doing, like, you know, uh, Braun Strowman and, you know, Ric Flair jokes and yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, uh, yeah, and you're just lost. Uh, yeah, just going all over my head and like, okay, I, I mean, you're a, yeah, uh, you're a fan of it, but there's supposed to be like some sort of inside reference I'm supposed no, to know well, about. It's, the way I look at it like with wrestling, what a lot of people don't know is, you know, like the mainstay promotion, WWE, what used to be WWF, you know, obviously, I'm sure you at least know that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, see, that. Yeah. Even yeah, if you're completely clueless, you at yeah. least know, like, you know, what WWF and guys like Hulk Hogan and Macho Man, you know, they're the guys that basically, like, molded the sport into what it's become. But what a lot of people don't know is it's, like, it's actually, like, the number one brand across, like, all social media in the entire world. They're the only brand that has over a billion fans, you know, like, nobody else. Not even NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, none of that. And... I kind of mirror the fact that, like, well, you know, I, I, I've never seen pro wrestling. It's like I get that because, like, after wrestling is actually NASCAR. How many people do you talk to about yeah, NASCAR? That's <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. Like, there's just because they have like a ton of fans, there's still just as many people like clueless to it. So don't feel like the odd man out. Oh no, no. But you definitely course. need to hop on that train, bro. It's a good ride. What, pro wrestling NASCAR? is a good ride to be on. No, the hell with NASCAR. Oh, it's like, oh my god. No, I watch that for the crashes. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I'm a pro wrestling fan. I like the carnage. Yeah, I mean, I've been to, like, a WWE event, and, I mean, yeah, it was fun, it was entertaining, but I didn't get, like, you know, why is this guy, why is everybody so mad at this guy? I mean, 
what what did he do to anybody? <laughs> oh yeah, well that's that's the heel drawing heat. Yeah, you know yeah, that, that's I mean, the yeah. Everybody has a role to play. There's the good guys and the bad guys. Mm-hmm. Well, so I'll, I'll I'll smarten you up a little bit. Okay, as we yeah, say can, as we yeah, say in the me, business, give me all the your bad guys are your heels. Your good guys are your baby faces. So those are the those are the terms that that we use. Mm-hmm. So and then you got you guys that kind of ride the lightning, where it's like you don't know if they're like baby face or heel. They're just like badass, and people love them for some reason. Yeah, you know, yeah, like Stone Cold like Steve that. Austin is probably like the epitome of that. Like literally, like. He could he could go like either way at any point in his career, heel or face. But like that dude was so hot at one point, like he was the hottest commodity in pro wrestling. Now, who do you think is? I mean, I would think you know because they're being more, I guess, female centric. I mean, they want more, I guess, inclusion and I mean, which is a good thing. Oh, like so the, this year, yeah, like the women are like on the same level. And actually, this year, the main uh, event, the baby, the main event is all women. It's mm-hmm. between Ronda Rousey, Becky Lynch, and Charlotte Flair. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, and they're just, I mean, and they're at the, I mean, they're same level, which I think is a good thing. Oh, full blow. Like the, the women totally deserve the main event at this year's mania. It's the best storyline that they've told over the last year. It includes the best on screen character that's developed over the last year. And Becky Lynch with her gimmick of the, of the quote unquote, the man. Uh, it's just been absolutely beautiful to watch. So to see the women now get, that big of a main stage you know like it's literally the biggest night in the entire industry of pro wrestling and they are the main event so uh it's hats off to them i hope they crush it i know they will and hopefully people will stop looking down on women's wrestling because a lot of these girls can go just as much as the boys yeah i think that i think that's when it sounds when it feels most right because they're not that just giving to oh because you're lazy it's your turn hell no no no, the, no you it's like no you're getting this because you earned it and you deserve it they so fought that's where it kind of feels like a little more like kind of condescending mm-hmm. so like if you give it to them like oh because they're ladies i'll let them have their turn like no like that seems a little insulting to their effort. Well, they did that back in the like in the Attitude Era when they're like, what was the more more insulting back then? I mean, obviously, I was a teenager at this time, so I loved it. But looking back on it, when they had these like gimmicky like bra and panties yeah, matches, it seems more you had gimmicky. to like rip the other girl down to her like bras and panties. It's like that that's like super like degrading, sure. especially when you had like women like uh, like Trish Stratus and Lita, who were basically like the first like women to really step up and show like no, the girls can work. You know, they were the first like main event ever uh, women's main event on Raw. And people thought it was like, what? They're letting the girls main event a Raw? And, you know, now fast forward. Now they're main eventing WrestleMania. Like, the, the girls can go. you got to give them just as much credit as the boys. Absolutely. You know, uh, on, I've seen some girls, like, they they come into the back. they got just as many welts on them as, uh, as the guys in the ring. You know, Oh, yeah, they, they ain't screwing There's just down. as much passion for it. I mean, it, I'm just so. watching, like, highlight reels. and like, damn. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but that's an, it's like, you know, people, I think they, like, get so blindsided by the fact that it's like, yes, it's like a, it's a – a fight or or a match, whatever you want to call it, that's going on in the ring. But it's like it's also it's it's a spectacle. It's an entertainment. Like what you get, you tell me another television show where in one episode I'm gonna see a guy go through a table, get hit with a chair, and also punch out a referee. Give me what what other television show are you gonna get that? Exactly none, <laughs> none whatsoever. I was gonna say in my fa- in my fantasy Kardashian episode maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but I now, think the only thing close would maybe Jerry Springer. Well, yeah, but then that's the only reason you ever watched that shit. You didn't the watch it for the wonderful right. interviewing content. You watched <laughs> it to see two white trash people lose their minds and start throwing down over who the baby daddy is. That's yeah. that, that's pro fucking pro wrestling. Hell, I'm pretty sure they did that storyline in the '90s, like. Uh, so it's that to me. It's like I'm like you're. I'm, I'm not gonna get th- this entertained anywhere else. <laughs> you know what I mean? So and and I like the fact that we also uh, actually a few weeks ago our mutual friend AJ Haypenny pointed out that there's actually I have a doppelganger in Brody King man Brody King. Like I said, like we were talking about that before. I was genuinely like upset that AJ beat me to the punch of sharing Brody's picture on your Facebook when he debuted at Ring of Honor <laughs> because that's a everybody anybody who knows you and watches wrestling I guarantee they did a double take at their screen yeah. it's like oh my god Tony lives a double life like <laughs> you would have to know like if you don't know indie wrestling like Brody started out in the California independence and the, the the kid can work so it's like he's there's no there's no shock that he's coming up as fast as he is. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, it was like, I was fascinated, but also like upset at the same time. Like there's another version of me. 
I, I, it was like it was like Highlander almost. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like another knuckle dragging tattooed bearded guy out there. How dare you? Yeah. So. <laughs> now you guys can now you need to start training. We can have the first ever real life Mortal Kombat mirror match. Yes. Like <laughs> if you guys wear the same exact tights, same exact everything. Oh my god. That would just confuse the hell out of crowds. Like which one is he? Oh no, they, they've done that in the past, which was great. Uh, they did it. Uh, with referees back in the day with the Hebner brothers uh, so like there was a it was a match it was it was Hulk Hogan and oh, I forget who it was he was working but I know Million Dollar Man had this thing where it was like he paid off the, a referee to get like facial reconstructive surgery because like you couldn't tell who the ref was that counted the three count it was supposed to be this yeah. like big like thing and then they also like did it again in like the mid 90s with uh, Doink the Clown they had like two doink the clowns that were like messing with each other. They were the uh, that were messing with his opponent, so you never knew like where doink was gonna come from. Yeah, and, like it was two guys in the same in the same suit, but it was just a fun storyline. So yeah, yeah that's what we can a, do. It's like it's like a, like a real life version of us. You yeah, know? yeah, pro wrestling <laughs> us. Like yeah, my my tethered. <laughs> oh my god that'd be such a good gimmick too like <laughs> like as a pro wrestling fan i can see yeah, it right if I now i just show up in a red onesie and a pair of scissors and oh like oh my god and i just use my regular talking voice like <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, no, man. You're, you're nailing the voice though. i'm telling you man, this this could be your gimmick the, te- the tethered brody <laughs> king you you are? that's amazing that's amazing i'm you Hopefully you guys can fill in more parts of the story that us kind of like left out. They're just like, hey, there's a bunch of psychotic lookalikes that live underground. Have a good night. It's like they never explained how it happened. Did you miss me? (laughs) Now, yeah, to to, to segue into that, obviously we both saw us different times and I enjoyed it. Um, I I guess from one to ten, I give it a seven. It was was an enjoyable, suspenseful thriller. I liked it. I mean... But I guess everybody was so enthralled by uh, Get Out, which set the bar pretty high. It's like, oh, man, what's it going to do? Because I saw the trailer. It's like, oh, I love this concept. Get Out, I could not get enough of. Like, mm. that, I thought the, the writing, the, the lighting, the acting, the cinematography, the dialogue, like everything about that movie yeah. was damn near perfect, if not perfect. What I liked about it also is because it, it wasn't as predictable like any, every other horror movie is. Yeah, yeah. It's like, it, oh, okay, this is where like, they hold on, like there's like, a jump scare coming out. Mm-hmm. or No, they put you in like this situation. It's like... Like sometimes whenever I'm watching a movie, I put myself in their mm-hmm. place. Like, what would I do in this situation? Yeah. yeah. And then, like, uh, like when the lady did the little teacup thing and the guy falls into like the sunken place, mm-hmm. I'm like, that that sounds like just hell. Oh yeah. Just like just be trapped watching. Just, you're just like you know just a passenger. Mm-hmm. And that 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 that's scary. That itself is like legit. Scary. Like a, that's a mind fuck right there. Oh that's, yeah. That's why that movie. You walked out of the theater after seeing Get Out, and you were just like. Yeah, I don't, I don't feel right right now. <laughs> like you had to like process what you just saw. Yeah. And what you were talking about with like the you know the twist that uh, that came in that movie that you didn't see coming because like usually like in horror movies it's pretty predictable. I think that was my biggest gripe with us. I I could have done without the twist at the end yes. because I already had it pegged so far earlier in the movie and it went so far along that I was like, oh, all right, maybe maybe that's not how it worked out. And at the end of the movie, they were, I was like, ah, oh, god damn it, that just yeah. ruined it for me. So yeah. that's where I was at, like about like you know like a nine. I was, and, but then like once that happened, I was, I was I'm like, you know what, this is a seven. You know, get, yeah. get out is still. Out of it, because I, I was super excited going into this movie. Like I, I haven't been that excited to see a film in a long time because I'm a big Jordan Peele fan. Not just you know, uh, you know, with 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 Get Out and how the way his mind works. Uh, you know, the Twilight Zone uh, relaunch that he has mm. coming up. But also, it's like you know, you rewind the clock. You know, the Key and Peele stuff. You know, yeah, they, they they were hilarious. Uh, my my fiance, you know, I, I never followed the show that much, but she sat me down recently and like, and she was like, "How have you? How are you such a Jordan Peele fan and you've never watched all of his Obama sketches?" <laughs> I'd only seen like well, I'd seen him do the Obama character, but I had never seen like the anger interpreter. Oh, yeah, the had anger Luther. interpreter. Oh my god, dude, I was in <laughs> stitches. I was like, "Baby, thank you so much for showing me yeah, this shit." Like, I mean, yeah, like. He's all being all, you know, polite and presidential. Yeah. But then here comes... Oh, my God. Luther is so Here comes Key good. just coming in, just saying what he's really thinking. But then he actually... But then they had him at, like, a correspondence dinner where oh, yeah, he actually he, did yeah, they, 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 they did the real... Yeah, he came in, did the real anger Amazing. interpreter while the real was so Obama good. was out there, too. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 
And yeah, it's, it's something that's kind of like a mind fuck, like how that is the same guy who made us and get out. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a good, like, you know, this is how far, like, he doesn't want to be pigeonholed as just a comedy guy. He, this guy. No, he's creative, period. Oh, absolutely. Period. I mean, he said he wrote Get Out, like, back when he was in college. Mm -hmm. no, and, his mind is just on another level. It's oh, yeah. Just the way his creativity and things work. Absolutely. And I guess spoilers, uh, we're going to talk about, you know, our gripes with us. I mean, here's why I like, I like the concept. It was like, you know. A modern ver like a scarier version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Mm -hmm. They're just evil clones. I'm like, great, I like that. And Lupita Nyong'o, who is just, just crushing it wherever she goes. I mean, she was in Star Wars, Black Panther, now this. Mm -hmm. Like she, she, girl's crushing it. And she already has like an Oscar. It was like, oh, she's gonna get an Oscar for this. I'm like, mm, let's not get too ahead of ourselves. But oh, she'll get an Oscar someday. Maybe like a nom, eventually. maybe a nom because she played two characters. Mm -hmm. But uh, but so yeah, I like the concept. I like the whole idea of like there's an evil version of you coming after you knows everything about you. Mm -hmm. I'm like, how would I go against evil me? Because I know all my moves. <laughs> like, oh, he, even, yeah, you, no went, you went further with it than I did. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, I'm like, you know, if evil me came after me, then like, oh, he's going, he's he's gonna do a nut shot. He... <laughs> <laughs> like well, he, I mean, if this if evil me just has scissors, I just I got a gun, so it's game yeah. over. Or, so, no, oh, that was a, that'd be like the shortest <laughs> film ever. You see, like evil me at the door, like knock, just gunshot, roll credits. And, uh, you know what'd be really funny if. Uh, if uh, oh this would be I think this would be awesome if they included this in the movie if like you know the evil clone which has a pair of scissors gets defeated by the good the original with a rock <laughs> and then rock we have the third clone show up with a stack of paper <laughs> and it's game on bitches <laughs> just <laughs> paper cut <laughs> you know I, I gotta take it back to wrestling there's a uh, a gentleman uh, I don't know where he's from but his name is Richard Schnary and he does this gimmick called the librarian and he literally, like, not only will he hit you with a book when he does, like, hardcore matches, he'll, like, paper cut you, like, with the book. Like, it's, it's really well done gimmick, for, especially Ooh. in matches like that. For, like, so, like, you're talking about, like, you know, messing people up with a piece of paper. Yeah. I've seen it! <laughs> this is where I go back to, you know, pro wrestling. <laughs> you're not going to find entertainment like that anywhere. No. Like, <laughs> <laughs> and I was also thinking, like, you know, if Evil Me came at me with a pair of scissors, usually I think, oh, he's going to chop off my beard. Yeah, <laughs> dude, do you have nightmares where like you like, it, well, it's a nightmare to us, but mm. like a dream where like you shave or something happens and you wake up, you're like gripping at <laughs> your face. Oh, like, oh, okay. Oh, it's still there. Oh, thank God. It's still there. Oh. <laughs> I had one night I got, I got in, uh, uh, you know, cause my girl and I, we have like such, uh, different like schedules where she's just as much like a workhorse and, and a hustler as I am. So we're always on the go. And there was one night where like I got home before her and I was already in bed and I had gotten my beard like trimmed that day, but he took off a little bit too much like you know so I was I was feeling a little salty about it you know what I mean uh so then I got, she gets into bed and I'm asleep and then all of a sudden I just feel like something tugging at my face but then I hear what the fuck <laughs> and I wake up she's like where is it like because she she always like go like underneath the beard and like almost like take like a nap but like this day she like couldn't pull the beard like over her cheeks so I've, I, I'm just waking up to somebody just like yanking at my face <laughs> yeah she loves the beard bro yeah that, that, the gonophile that itself is like its own little horror movie <laughs> <laughs> what would you what would you the bearding oh the bearding <laughs> I can't grow it anymore. That itself would be like an episode of Twilight Zone. It's, it's like a dude who like can't grow a, like a full beard. It's like comes in all patchy, so he starts taking like these growth hormones, but it like augments his mind. Yeah. Like <laughs> <laughs> actually, there was a Kids in the Hall sketch. I don't know if you heard it. Like, um, yeah, or a Kids in the Hall sketch about this guy who like caught a fish. Like, you know, what? I think I'll grow a beard. But then it just started like you know making him crazy. Like the longer and bigger it got, it just drove him insane. That's pretty much how it goes. Like, yeah. <laughs> like that's everyone. Like, I remember, like when I mean, I always like had like a like a like a thin beard, you know, mm. like some type of facial hair, just because I've always had a baby face. And then, like, I remember when I broke my leg, I was just you know, I didn't walk for like three, four months, so I was just like, I didn't give a shit about how I looked. And then when I rejoined society, everyone was like, "Dude, beard's looking good." I was like, "All right, I guess I'll keep this shit now." Yeah. Like. And it's been like all different lengths, so it's like, but I, it's been so long, I don't even remember what the hell I look like clean shaven at this point. 
Yeah, I'm like, in the same way, and part of me's like, you know, I don't think I do. No, because that's the thing. It's like it's because I mean, granted, like it's, it's it has become like super trendy, but it's like I always had a beard like before, like the, this like yeah. big boom of like millennials and these man bun pains in the asses that like you know have a beard now. I think the only it's person like, that's allowed to have a man bun is Jason Momoa. Everybody else. Yeah, everyone else just stop. Get back on your urine cycle and get out. Yeah, because <laughs> like what's ironic about the beard is it's like it's looked at like, at like such like a pinnacle of manliness but those of us that have beards it's not the most manly thing i have way more products for my beard than i have ever had for any other part of my body combing it out drying it keeping up with it getting certain beard washes and special soaps like there's a lot of like pampering that goes into a beard it's a a little counterintuitive oh yeah super like when you gotta go to the like you you've been to a barber to have it trimmed up it's not just like a guy with a buzzer it is like a full-blown day at the spa it is like i'll I'll, when i get my beard trimmed there's a seaweed wrap involved i'm getting (laughs) I'm getting like this like pumice stuff on my face. It's a big deal. Like so like we may like we may be looked at as like a pinnacle of manliness, but I'm not gonna act like I ain't a little bit of fancy boy involved because I have a whole cabinet that's just beer products. Yeah, I have a little section all for my oils and creams. That's the thing. I have like two or three different brushes. Mm -hmm. There, (laughs) like I I live with a woman now who has like tons of makeup. I have the biggest part of the bathroom with all my beard shit. <laughs> Just oils and balms and salves and yep. combs. Do you use uh, like a blow dryer to like... You know it, baby. Mm-mm. But I, but I've noticed it starts to get to like a certain point where like it doesn't always work. So I got it like one of those like rounded combs where you got to kind of like... You, you oh, curl really? It and, and you know, you got to kind of like pull it out. Because I'm not, I'm not taking a straight iron to my beard. That's ridiculous. I think they have like special like... Uh, heated combs. They just for do, that. but it's like I've heard some horror stories about guys like it, it gets too heated and they actually like burn a part of their beard off. I, I'm not, I'm not risking that because it's like I'm already enough of a control freak. Like I've always had like an obsession with symmetry. So like when I'm about to go out, I'm like constantly like in the mirror. Like is this, is this even over here? Mm-hmm. Is, is this all right over here? Like. Uh, it, it's it. It's, that's what's funny is about. It. I've always just found that ironic that people look at us like he's a man. It's like yeah, I'm actually. I probably spend more time in the bathroom than your girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like I spend. I would say between fifteen and twenty minutes. To try just. Oh yeah, yeah. Just like that's why know, it's like everyone. Yeah, was, I have. Yeah. Like this week, you know, I, I shaved all my hair off, and everyone was like, "Oh man, it looks so good." It's like ultimately, I just wanted to save time in the bathroom because I'm having to take time for my hair and my beard. Beard mm-hmm. wins. Like, if I got to shave off one of them, the hair is gone. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I think it's interesting how, like, there, it, like the whole beard trend mm-hmm. is, like, almost catches. Like, uh, like I start growing it because uh, part of me is like, I don't give a shit anymore. Mm-hmm. And part of me is like, oh, let's see if this works. And I finally find something that works. Yeah. <laughs> because before I always had a little bit of stubble, but then I'm like, oh, look at this. You know, eggy bitch. You know, with the <laughs> like you look like yeah. you can't. Like, oh, look, he can't grow the full beard. Yeah, this giant beaver-looking motherfucker. <laughs> then I'm just like, oh, it's like, oh, let's see what happens if I just let it all go. Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, huh, this uh, this actually works. Totally, I like this. And then, um, and then there's also, it seems like uh, anybody who has a beard also has like you know three things. They have the beard, they have this undercut or like mm-hmm. some sort of like nice hair, and they have a lot of tattoos. Mm-hmm. And it's like, huh. It's like, are we all just like, you know, like trendy clones of each other? Like, it's weird how... Well, like, how many times I, I, does this like, I don't know you? what to call this. I, there was like, I mean, there was a time where it was like lumber sexual. Which is like the dumbest fucking term it, ever. It, it really is. Like what, we fuck trees? That's yeah. the dumbest uh, term that I've ever heard at all. Like, so. Yeah. So I'm like, what, what are we supposed to call this? Just like beard, nice hair, and tattoos. I'm like, what? Like, is this like a thing? Like, a, just... Well, that's the aggravating part. Like, like that, like because little it, roadie... Actual. It came so because tra- <laughs> it came so trendy. It's like how many times has happened to you where people will be like, "Hey, this looks like you," and it's just another dude with a beard and and like tattoos. It's like that looks nothing like me, you no. asshole. I, I already there's already enough carbon copies out there. It's like I've been getting tattooed since I was 16 years old. You know, mm. I, it's like so like this isn't something that I just woke up and was like, "Oh, let me have a beard and tattoos." Yeah. It's and it's like most of the guys that have it, it's like, dude, your beard's patchy. Like, stop. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it looks like a tumbleweed. Yeah. Yeah, get that, it's get a, shit out of here. Yeah, I, I hate that. Like you see, like my boyfriend's so hot. He's got a beard, and it's like he's got like a patch of fur like up here on his cheek. There's like some sort of soul patch going on here. It's like that's yeah. not a beard. It's a it's a growth deficiency. Yeah, I mean that's like Twitch gamer beard. You know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was that better. I, would, I was trying to think of like a gamer reference, but my my mind blank. <laughs> that, yeah, that's the beard of somebody who just plays Call of Duty. Yep. <laughs> 
<laughs> but all right, so you know, like we've been, you know, we've talked about, you know, like us. We talked a little bit about pro wrestling. You know, now we talked about beards. But it's like, you know, what caught my attention about this uh, about this podcast? We've known each other for a while. Mm-hmm. Was the title? You know, because I know you so well. I know how much you are with comedy. And I also know how much you are in the gym. Mm-hmm. You know, so like with this, you know, do you even laugh? So like, let's let, let's talk a little bit about like comedy. What? I'm actually going to interview you on your podcast oh. here. What what inspired the uh, the the title of this? Because I thought that that's really what got my attention. Oh, thanks. Because especially in the world of podcasts, with how many there are, coming yeah. up with a title is not as easy as everybody thinks. Like coming up with like this is basically going to be your brand. Oh, so yeah. you know what I mean. So like, wh- how did, how did this uh, start? Well, it was, it was always like floating in the back of my head for a while, and because I was like, do I really want to start a podcast? Because everybody and their mother has a podcast mm-hmm. now. And I think that's actually a title of one. Yeah. Yeah, probably. Yeah, mo- yeah mom chat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, if, if it's everybody... Your mother's their, podcast. If it's everybody and their mother, then it's probably just a bunch of Italians. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, I get the reason why it's like, you know what, I'll, I'll throw my hand to the ring. Let's see what happens. Because, um, you know, I, I've been on the sidelines long enough. So, like, you know, I'm going to, yeah, I'll throw my voice out. Mm-hmm. And. Well, dude, it's been, I mean, you've been doing comedy now in the Boston area for like, what, like four or five years? Uh, like no, just past year number six. Six years. Oh, all right, cool. Mm-hmm. I know we came in, like, I was already like doing it when you had like come in. Like, I, I just finished. I'm coming up the end of this month will be seven. Oh, so, perfect. So, uh. And I still feel just as clueless when I get on stage sometimes, oh, yeah. I which mean, is ironic. Yeah, this, I mean, like I look at my, I look at my resume and I'd be like, "How the hell did I actually pull some of this shit off?" Yeah. You know what I mean? But it's like you know, you've been involved in comedy for a while. You work and are part of a very prestigious radio station out of Boston in AAF. So I wouldn't say you're so much like, thro- you know, like oh, let me see what I can. I, I think you kind of like. You deserve, not so much deserve to be here, but you should be doing something right. like this. You know yeah. what I mean? You know, like the fuck sitting on the sidelines. No. Uh, too many, like, we know just how lazy some comedians and creatives uh-huh. can get. You know, where, that's what's funny is it's like, I was talking about this with a producer of a film that's on the, the festival circuit that I was in right now. We were talking the other day about, like, what the film, like, has become and everything like that. And, uh... He was asking me about, like, about, we were talking about, like, work ethic and everything like that. But we really are, like, some of the laziest people like in the world like when it but when it comes to like little things you know like you like you ask me to like you know Derek can you go on the road last minute to go do a gig hell yeah I'll, I'll do that Derek can you work we're gonna be on this film for like 48 hours straight are you sure you can like, totally can handle it uh Derek uh, can you fill out this this form mm-hmm. <sighs> I don't Some, know, paperwork like and work. people. I don't know if I want to do that. Like, mm. it's we're lazy with the weirdest shit. Mm. Like, so especially with something like, you know, like, you know, with where we have to, like, write. How often do we actually sit down and write rather than just be like, let me just go up on stage I, and no, see what I happens? Feel, I, feel guilty <laughs> if, I feel guilty if I go one day without writing. Yeah. I mean, like, I feel guilty. I mean, it's, you know, it's become, you know, just so important and part of my life like mm-hmm. you know if i end up like skipping the gym two days in a row i just feel all gross you feel like, like a piece of shit yeah i feel like old job of the hoodie just blah. i just started going to the gym again like about a month ago because now with being involved you know have more heavily involved in pro wrestling i'm surrounded by guys who are in like peak physical condition you know mm-hmm. it's like i, I don't want to look like the only schmuck did in the I locker room that, some iron. yeah you know what i mean so it's been feeling good like getting back into the gym and i'm like wow why did i stop doing this in the first place you know mm-hmm. then i remember like oh yeah i had to have surgery uh so, I forget. I don't know. I forget no, like, the point that I was yeah, making. So there, if but. we, yeah, I mean, I yeah, we're talking about writing. If you go like, if I go one day without oh, yes, writing, without writing was, one joke, whether it's good or bad, or it's just a thought, then I'm like, I just wasted a wasted a day it, without, it, with no productivity, with no getting those gears turning, you know. And that's really what it is. It's just to like get the gears turning. Like that was probably the hardest thing I think for me to understand as being a comedian because like you know every always everyone always talks about like you gotta write, you gotta write, you gotta write. And I would put so much pressure on myself that you're just sitting there staring at like either like a blank, a blank screen trying to think of like oh what am I gonna write about or or like you're sitting there just staring at paper. It's like one of the shittiest feelings in the world when you yeah. try to like force it. What I've actually come to find out is, is, so like this year. Uh, you know, with you, you know, you're launching. You know, like you've gotten into like this podcast. I I rewound the clock even further. I started a freaking blog this year. You know, on my website. So like, oh, I, I went all the way back to like. Oh, let's get let's get into this. But it's but really what it is. It's that 
thing of write every day. It doesn't necessarily have to just be comedy. As long as you're writing, you never know where a joke could like come out. I've mm. gotten jokes just from writing in my blog and then be like, oh wait, let me, and then you write a little note off to the side and you, I'm like, that would actually go with this joke that I use in my act. And it's, so that's really, it's more about just keeping the gears turning, I think yeah. is what about writing every day is. Not so much like putting pressure on yourself to just write comedy. Yeah, you know what I, I, mean? um, I, I, read, I just finished reading this book called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And it, it, I mean, I recommend it. It's really, it's a really good book. Who and wrote part, that? Hmm? Who writes? Who wrote that? Uh, Mark Manson. Ah, oh, I can say I know him. Yeah, yeah. I think he's actually. I think he uh, he was he was born in Boston. Then he like moved down to Texas, and he just. Uh, that's totally fitting that a Boston guy wrote a book that said the subtle art of not giving a fuck. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, it's really good. And one of the one of the things uh, he touched down upon was like, um, yeah, like creativity, mm -hmm. like developing, growing. And sometimes when you hit that wall, then you just don't want to do anything. Yeah, yeah. And which we've some, all felt. It's yeah. A, it's a miserable feeling. Yeah, and sometimes, uh, yeah, it's like some weird cycle where, like, how to spark creativity. And I think what he said was, if nothing's in the wall, then just, like, go about your day, do some, just bring yourself to do something. Mm -hmm. Because the thoughts are going to come. Because to me, those are, like, when the best jokes come, when you least expect it. Totally. Yeah, because... Um, I mean, you were just like, you know, going along, then just some like hits you in the head like, wow, that, that's a really good one. Dude, literally, like, I have a, about, was a, it was a, my gig last week, uh, I was performing in Connecticut, and there's a bit that I've been doing for years, and on the way there, I wrote a new tag to it, and I was, it was one of those moments where I was like, how the fuck did I never think of that before? Yeah. And it worked perfectly on stage. So I'm like, all right, I'm adding that. It only took me fucking three years to add it to the joke. <laughs> like, what took me so long to figure out this joke, which was like sitting in front of me this whole time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's really all it was. It was just something something that happened that just, it clicked. And I was just like, that, but you almost feel like an idiot that you're like, how did I not connect yeah. that before? You know what I mean? But this is where like, you know, with like, you know writing or, or doing some sort of creativity on a daily basis. What the hell was that? Yeah, it's just the vents. They randomly turn on. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's the most random thing. Any, yeah. That's why I was like, Jesus, I'm like, we're filming from the cockpit right now. You know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are now flying at uh, 20,000 feet. Uh, yes. I'm going to ask you to yeah, this remain is the seated ASMR at all times. If you leave your seat, your seatbelt sign, come on. Please remain seated with a seatbelt fasten. Tell, tell me we'll be landing soon. <laughs> Every they, there's always like this, like the guy, the, the captain is always a very. Uh, what about uh, yeah? Now everyone will be serving beverages in the uh, cabin. It's like, like, why are you William Shatnering this shit right now? Yeah. Just fucking talk. Like the guy, he's, it's like he's a mix of like Shatner and Bob Ross. It's like a quaalude for your ears. It's like it we're is. already sleeping. Enough with the announcements. Yeah, I'm like, th and this affects me how? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't uh, care how high in the sky we are. Just get me where I'm going. If you uh, look out your window, you will see a cloud that uh, looks like... Yeah, I'd uh, love to look out the window if this asshole wasn't leaning forward and taking the armrest yeah. at the same time. If you look out on the, the left seat. side of the aircraft, you will see a cloud that looks like a duck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's why I would never be able to be a pilot because I would have like that. Maybe that's what it is. It's like a power thing that comes just, with it. Like, just be open mic in the yeah. entire time. <laughs> Just working with, oh my God. People would be like getting off that plane. Never, I'm never flying Delta again. Like, <laughs> just have their hands on that emergency hatch. <laughs> I remember one time. I Where's got, the air marshal? It's always so funny when you're on a plane and they're like, if you're sitting in the exit row, they have that. So in a case of emergency, are you willing to help? Has anybody ever just been like, nah? Like, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I mean that, I'll help. I get more leg room. Of course I'll help. I think the only person that actually approached that question is Larry David on uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm. Like he was seated at the at that part of the plane mm -hmm. and, he's, and he actually brought that up. And of course, he makes it just a big thing. It's like, I don't feel comfortable doing this. <laughs> Can I and switch? That sounds like such a Larry David. Yeah, he, too. he just just Fucking snowballs genius. into this giant thing, which did it absolutely had no need to turn to this giant thing, mm -hmm. and it just made it such a big deal. It's like you know, I don't feel comfortable doing this. But that's what Larry's so good at taking like the everyday stuff and turning it turning it into you know humor and entertainment. Yes, it's like, that's why everyone always talks about you know with like uh, like one of my favorite shows of all time being Seinfeld. But like everybody always talks about like Jerry and everything. It's like yo, Larry was very much a creative force in that show. And even with Curb Your Enthusiasm, you know, everyone, it's like, you, 
that dude is a fucking comedic genius. Yeah. There's not much that he can't take and turn into something. Oh, God. I mean, it, I mean, he makes it look so easy. And that's like the almost, I don't want to say aggravating part, but like it's like, how do you do it so effortlessly? Yeah. Like, it's like looking at comedy Picasso, mm-hmm. you know? But then even... But then again, even in his case, he's probably not satisfied with how he creates no, anything. That's the ironic part. It's like we are all such our own like worst critics. It's yeah. like, you know, uh, we can get off stage and, and we're like, well, I enjoyed that show so much. You will find at least three, four, th- maybe five things wrong that, that, you know, yeah. to yourself that you did on stage. And it's like this, it's the smallest stuff. Mm-hmm. Like I've literally gotten like, like, well, my body language wasn't right for that joke. It's like, really? That, that, that's, how, that's how hard we are on we ourselves? Are like, yeah, the worst. yeah, we really are. <laughs> Like, there's nothing worse than bombing and having that long, especially when you bomb far away from home, because now you have to have that long, quiet, reflective car ride home of like, why am I doing this to myself? Yeah, I remember um, I was, uh, I did a thing up in Maine a few years ago, and it was, it was the kind of bombing where there, it was like just no reaction from the crowd. It was just like, I was just performing for a bunch of Easter Island heads, just Mm-hmm. Maybe a few smiles here and there, but there's no like you know, even no like some real of my reaction. Age, even some like a jokes, maybe at best got like. Eh. Oh, that's that's when it's like the most brutal. Uh, like I was uh, uh, one of my worst bombs was right here in Boston at Nick's Comedy Stop. Uh-huh. I was hosting uh, one weekend for Jenny Zagrino and Tom Dustin, mm-hmm. and dude, it's like I I did like uh, like I tried to be playful at first, and then there was a part of me that's like, oh, all right, I'm gonna have to work tonight. Yeah, then that- well, you know what? Let's bust out that A material. Yeah, it didn't make a fucking difference. Then, like, <laughs> then suddenly it becomes the longest seven minutes of your oh, life. <laughs> you lasted all seven? <laughs> Fuck that. <laughs> 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 I've had times where it's just like, like one person that I have a lot of respect for in, in the New England comedy scene out of Connecticut, Davey Lozano. Have you have you worked with Davey? I don't think I have. Well, he he is one of, I think, very few, if not the only comic out of the New England scene that we have up here in the Northeast to actually advance to the finals at the Apollo. Ooh. Like, that's how far he got. But the way he describes it, he goes, when he got on stage for the finals, that crowd was so just ready to cut throats like if they don't like you it is immediately just boo. oh yeah like hard and he remembered he came out and he started his joke and they just weren't feeling it and he started to go a little bit further with it like trying to have that confidence like i'll win him back and he just stopped and he just looked at the crowd and he was like i'm not funny tonight huh <laughs> all right i can respect that thank you very much and he was just like you know what like just but he even out. said he's like that mind fucked him for like two years like he he just oh. he like wasn't really i mean the kid is incredibly funny but like that's what can happen if like one like ba- especially at that level too oh, like yeah. you want like no comedian ever makes it like past like the first round in the apollo never mind making it all the way to the finals mm. but like there are moments where you just like know like this is just gonna be brutal so like i have so much respect for him for just acknowledging that you know this just there's nothing i'm gonna say right now <laughs> y'all have a good night yeah enjoy remember, the next act i remember hearing a dave Chappelle talk about how he was only like a teenager like 15 16 and he's at the apollo mm-hmm. and yeah he didn't make it and even that guy who like kind of dances you off is like he just wanted to murder him oh yeah because <laughs> they don't they don't screw around but also look at what dave Chappelle has become too yeah he yeah he is you know i i don't i don't know the right analogy to describe but he's just arguably the king of comedy definitely yeah he's definitely on the mount rushmore as yeah. far as com- yeah it's, i'd say if you put it mount rushmore of comedians dave Chappelle would be up there mm-hmm. um Despite the backlash, Louis C.K. I would I would say I don't know if I'd put him on Rushmore. No, no, I don't know if I'd put him on Rushmore. Mm. Well, maybe maybe, maybe George. Are well, we George doing pers- are we doing like personal like Rushmores right now? I don't want to shit on your mountain. You oh, okay. I mean? Take like, it. Yeah, take a roll. <laughs> all right, so let's put. Because uh, Dave, Ch- Dave Chappelle. That would be mine. It would be Ch- Chappelle, Carlin, Carlin, uh, Pryor. Pryor. Okay, all right. What was the fourth one? Eddie Murphy. But, See that's that's sort of like uh it would either that's where I'm torn is it would either be have to be uh a Murphy or I was always a very uh, big at heart for Robin Williams. Oh oh yeah. So it's like so that's where it's like that last one it's like they're they're very neck and neck but, uh, but me personally Williams is what makes it onto my rush. What mark. what I like about Robin Williams is that he like his synapses were firing at all times. Like, mm-hmm. did you watch an HBO documentary? I cried at that documentary. Oh. I won't even lie. And my my fiance, we actually watched that. Uh, we're coming back from uh, the LA Film Festival this year. They had it on the plane. I don't because I don't have HBO. So as soon as I saw that, I'm like, they got the documentary. We gotta watch that right now. 
And after I said that, I just sat there, just like, honestly, like a little mind fucked because like there were like some similarities in personality traits that like I, that I shared with him. And I, like there was a part of me that was like, "Fuck, am I gonna end up like that?" Yeah, I mean, like there was a, there was a little bit of like that, and like of course you know my girl talks me off the ledge because like you know I, I, you know I have my, I have my own demons that I deal with you know outside outside of everything as we as we all do. I'm not gonna act like I'm so fucking special just because mm. I'm depressed every now and then. But uh, yeah, there was like so that that documentary really hit hard with me. I guess is the point I'm trying to make. Of like, I mean, it, it was just like the giant combination of of just like his. I mean, the fact that. Like his brain was always firing off, and everything. It he never did, stopped. Almost everything he did was gold. I mean, there, there have been. There's word that he might have like no word were stolen, but some material. But then at the same time, there have been times where I. It was like he this big special. He was like the special where he did at the big theater, mm -hmm. and the live did, on Broadway one or the or the may, weapons of mass destruction. I forget which one. All I remember is that he did 45 minutes of stuff his manager has never heard before like he did it oh yeah that for was the Bro first time that was broadway yeah yeah the broadway one dude and that's one of my favorite specials of all time i remember like I'm my like, where is all this coming from mm -hmm. like, it was just like a bombless pit of just just gold like i was always a big robin williams fan but when that stand-up came out i literally watched that every single night for an entire summer because that was the that was the year i graduated high school and we had I had recorded that stand up off of HBO when it debuted onto a VHS tape, which is a very old sentence. I understand that. <laughs> uh, and then I Next just thing you're gonna say I wore dungarees. Yeah, <laughs> and I just watched it over and over and over and over. Like it just never got old to me. Mm. And it, that to me is like that's such a, a beautiful mark of an incredible entertainer, where like you can just watch them over and over, even hear the same material, and it's still incredible every single time. Every time. So and with Robin, he, you know, actually, you know what you, you were talking about, like, like stolen material, or like, you know, you, you referenced that. Uh, I feel like there's a lot, especially now with like the internet, with how many people like steal memes and, and shit like that. You yeah. know what I mean? I feel like that has also kind of caused a lot of gripes where like people are so quick to throw like joke theft at, uh, at other comics. And it's like a lot of the times, uh, the, you know, parallel thinking is definitely a thing. Yeah. Yeah. This is actually something I talked about on this podcast a few episodes ago where I had, I believe I had two cases of joke theft. Mm -hmm. One, I mean, but the first one was a very clear case of parallel thinking. It mm -hmm. wasn't, I mean, I didn't know it at first. That's why I did a little detective work. And it's like, oh, okay. It was just, it was just like the subject matter and the order of the jokes they went. It's like, I have something almost similar, mm -hmm. but you know, the punchlines and everything else was different. Yeah, yeah. So parallel thing on that end. Whereas the other one, it was a little bit more blatant, but it was just like a one time thing. Gotcha. But this is it not like this was someone accusing you or you accusing somebody me, else? Me accusing somebody else. Gotcha. Gotcha. But you know, like the slate's clean on both of those. Yeah, yeah. But um but there have been times where like oh like I think of a joke, like, oh crap, this person thought of it, you know, years ago. So in case I like, oh, can I sometimes uh, I, I message something like, hey, uh, you did a thing about this. Mm -hmm. uh, would it be okay if I do this? Do you even do this anymore? And the person's like, no, oh, go ahead. It's but see, that, that sh right there shows your character. A lot of comics would not even waste their time. No, they don't even waste their time. To, like, to message or show it. the proper respect. Like, hey, man, I know you got a bit that's, you know, based on this. I was just thinking of, like, a bit that's, like, you know, the punchlines are different. You know, like, talk to the other comedians. You know, yeah. just be cool with one another. This fucking business is hard enough as it is without having to add more hurdles to it. And yeah. nine times out of ten, what I've come to see is the jackasses that are so quick to be like, yeah, they're fucking stealing material. They're just telling memes on stage. It's like... I've, I've yet to see you even get a laugh in the crowd. Stop worrying about everybody else's act and write your own fucking jokes. Exactly. Like, and Because that's the thing. It's like nine times out of ten, they're just so quick to try to point fingers. And it's like, now there have been instances where like, you know, like I, I was called out one time that they're uh, for, for joke theft. And uh, the guy, like, he was like, no, 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 seriously. Like, he, he, he was cool about it. He was like, I'm not trying to be, like, he knew like the boundary that he was stepping. It was actually, it wasn't even a comic. It was a fan in the crowd. Oh. Uh, and he came, he was like, I just wanted to show you. And it, there was a meme on the internet. Very similar to what I said on stage. Now, me, if I see something in a meme, I'm never fucking saying that again on stage. I want <laughs> nothing to do with anything that could be associated to that. Uh, just because it, it just gets annoying because there's so many goddamn memes out there. So it's like everyone's yeah. so quick to jump at the throats of like comics who are doing this on stage by themselves, but nobody's holding anybody accountable. Like that piece of shit, the fat Jew, the, oh, the guy. Yeah. Like, Really? Yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah. He, the guy's I mean, he, built he, such a freaking world of just stealing people's shit. And not only that, he had like 
little proxies, people who would go out to clubs, mm-hmm. listen, write down the people jokes, and then come back and say, you know, all right, here you go. Yeah, so you got he, that, and then you got these, like, uh, uh, you know, everyone always says, like, you know, you shouldn't talk bad about people. Fuck that. There's some pieces of shit in this world. Like, those guys, fuck Jerry. Fuck Jerry. I was just thinking the same thing. I hope thing. they die. I hope those pieces of shit die. They are the worst thing for creative and especially in social media. And what's worse is I actually had the displeasure of working with those assholes at one point when I was doing beta testing for apps in New York City. Really? Yeah, they're the worst pieces of garbage. That, and, and what sucks is it's like they're, they're to a point where like my little voice on the, on the spot, like nothing's going to stop those guys unless some, uh, like something happens, some sort of class action lawsuit to shut down their quote unquote social media marketing company. You're stealing shit left and right. All right. That's all it is. Like I was working for an app. It was called know me. It never went anywhere. Uh, Oh, what the hell was the name of the producer? That was was Anthony, uh, uh, whatever. Either way, there was a lot of people involved in the app and it was really building up to be something big. Like we had a huge showing at South by Southwest and you know, they, they, they sent myself and one of the other creatives to the shorty awards. And uh, it was looking like the app was really going to go somewhere. But fuck Jerry were the ones who were helping out with the social media campaign and trying to help grow the app. And they just had, like, this, this one dude, he just had such an ego on him. He goes by the alias Crispy Shorts. And it's like, I get that you've done some things, but what I'm witnessing from you right now, your idea of building up the app, you've stolen content from so many people and reposted it to the Nomi social media, acting like they're the ones that have produced it. Yeah. If you're going to share content, which is what it is, you're sharing it, give credit. All right. Yeah, they, yeah, that's, that's the, other the thing. If that's you don't, where if you don't give credit where credit is due. Then you're just—I mean—you're just taking a screenshot of somebody's tweet or somebody's content, posting it as your own, and soaking in all those mm-hmm. all that reaction from everybody and else. It's, it's, it happened to me. You know, like we're in WrestleMania season right now. I made a meme like a year ago. That was just like a stupid little like you know a thing that was that was funny to me and it went viral. It's got over ten. It's almost eleven million views on just my account alone. But that's not including the three other accounts who stole it and re- without any sort of reposting back to myself. So thank God I watermarked it. Yeah. So but what it comes down to is it's like that's like that line where it's social media where we don't have that uh, that on on stage. You can't tell somebody's joke and then be like, hey, did you like that? Well, that was written by Tony Capo Bianco. No, let me tell you some stuff. It's like, you can't do that on stage. So why the fuck do we allow it in social media? So this is why, like, this is where the gripes with guys like, like, fuck Jerry. It's like, you guys, I really wish you didn't, you don't do what you do. Because you're just, mm-hmm. you're not helping the real comedians, the real comics, the real people who are out there creating humor for people and then you get a piece of shit like you that comes along takes it and it's like now you get credit for that joke yeah. when you know I wrote that motherfucker like there's if you even look go on for the people listening go on Twitter and look up ha- uh, hashtag fuck fuck Jerry and it's a list of people who are trying to come out of the woodwork now to show they stole my joke they stole this joke they stole that joke like trying to put the proof out there yeah and, and but, just and soak in all the credit and all the profit like there's um I'm, I'm, I follow this um, all uh, Miss Mischief. Mm-hmm. She's like a tattooed uh, alternative model. And somebody out there, just some guy from like Norway or something, stole her photos, mm-hmm. started like, you know, making prints of them. Yeah, that's so fucked up, dude. And yeah. just selling them on his website with no credit or anything coming back to her. Mm-hmm. And I mean, and the guy's like, oh, I shot this. I'm like, you didn't shoot shit. Yeah, yeah. there's no way you did that. Yeah, st- yeah, stealing photos and just making them your own. It's like, no. Now, yet. what's what's ironic? Did you actually watch? A, there's a documentary on Netflix right now called American Meme or My American Meme or something I, like that. I saw it on my. I haven't watched it, but I think yeah, I think I know where we're going. There's with. a part on there where Dane Cook. They're interviewing him about it. Yeah. And he's saying he's like, you know, it's no longer fake it till you make it. Now it's take it till you make it. Yes. When I heard, now granted, the source that it's coming from is very ironic, you know, because he's been under fire for joke theft, like, like left yeah. and right. But it's, it's like when I heard that, I'm like, oh, there's a part of that that just hurts because it's so true. Yeah, he's, it's yeah, so he's right. It's so fucking true. He really, it really is. I mean, I mean, yeah, I'll, I'll be like, you know, I show, then if they, I'll hear like, you know, I have 20 jokes, maybe three of them were just stuff I've seen online. Mm-hmm. Just like, you know, whatever. I'm, I mean, people do on Reddit all the time. They just, steal and repost as their own if you're if if uh if you're going on stage and telling jokes that you've written on social media that you know then that's different uh yeah. like uh there's a gentleman that uh you know we worked at a, a competition at the old comics back when it was at foxwoods his name's dan lamort 
mm-hmm. and uh, you know, very funny guy. But he he uses Twitter as a test ground, like left and right. He even just put out a tweet the other day. If I put out a tweet and it works, I immediately take it to the stage. And it was a tweet he had put out in the afternoon, and it crushed on stage. So it's like he still wrote it, so it came from social media. But you know that there's probably a piece of shit out there that's like, I saw that tweet back in like 2012. And it's, I hate you. Yeah. I, like, I feel like there's always somebody looking for something to, to bitch about as yeah. far as like that's Dude. that's why it's like this actually is a very fitting title for that topic it's Absolutely. like do you even laugh bro like yeah. they, they get so uh, like pent up it's like yeah you just- yeah I mean like I was uh, listening to a Kevin Hart on the Joe Rogan podcast which he did like a just a couple days ago mm-hmm. and he was talking about the whole Oscars thing and that and then you know he was supposed to host the Oscars and then he stepped down because somebody went through 10 years of Kevin Hart tweets oh, it's just so- looking for something and they found something like you know some, just some lame, just 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 some tweet about like you know gay people. Yeah. yeah. And it was it was um, like seven or eight years. So he went seven or eight years worth of tweets just to find one thing, and then just bring it back into light. And we're like, oh my god, I can't believe he said such a thing. And like he was, what like thirty one at the time. Yeah. Like what do you expect? And like, look, at the, wor- look at the world. Look at the world of comedy. He's not the same person now. Look at the world of comedy. Who else? Are you going to book that you need a clean comedian? Who the fuck else are you going to book? At that level. Who are you else going to... Guys, I know Cosby sure as hell ain't free to take bookings right uh-huh. now. Who the hell else are you going to take that's a clean comedian? And Kevin Hart is too rough for you? Comedy's dead. Like, when I heard that hurt my soul when they were like, nah, he's too... I'm like, really? Kevin Hart is too much for you? Really? That's some disheartening shit. No pun intended with... Actually, no. Kevin Hart, if you're listening, you can use that for your next special. Disheartening. <laughs> Disheartened. It was just like, are you kidding me? And so that's why it's like I totally understand where like some comics are hanging it up right now and because it's 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 a very hard granted it's always been a hard craft but I do believe that like right now it's a very hard craft. We already go into it knowing you're not going to please everybody on stage. Yeah. You're not going to make everybody laugh that's something we all have to uh like accept. But it's almost getting to a point now like if I can get 5 people in this crowd to laugh tonight. You know yeah. what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, because because I mean, you never know what's gonna happen on stage. You never know what's gonna set people off at all. Yeah, I have I have had somebody like uh, what the hell was it? There was a time, it was a Portuguese joke, you know that gets a laugh every time. But there was one Portuguese woman out in the crowd that was offended by that because she has you know a little hair on her lip. You know, it was, it was just a joke about you know like Portuguese with facial hair, obviously. You know, and she got all bent out of shape about it. It was like, bitch, really. Are you that? Why did why even buy a ticket to a comedy show if you're just gonna come to the comics after the show and explain about what you didn't like? Yeah, yeah. I did you like that. anything? Did you even enjoy your night like, at all? Do you ever have any type of joy in your life? Period. It's like th- that's where you draw the line. Yeah, really. That's it's like, it. There's nothing funny about my facial hair. Yeah, go uh, home and yeah, put actually, it as a status like everybody is, else. Like, like it, no one. Uh, yeah, that's you, another thing. I hate when people say there is nothing funny about blank. I'm like. Go kill well. yourself. Look, we're on stage. It's an art form. It's a craft. Yeah. If you can't accept that, like, it's called a joke for a reason. Yes. I like, mean, yeah, we're not up there doing TED Talks. No. No, hell, that's why I love what, what, like, you know, we talked about Chappelle earlier. He blatantly said, even in one of his specials, he's like, I'll never apologize for what I say up here. Mm-mm. And we shouldn't have to. We really shouldn't. Yeah, because there's no, I mean, there's no, never, I mean, at least in our case, there's never sort of ill intent to actually harm no it's never with malice anybody. it's not yeah. well some people you know you got the comics who think that shitting on the crowd is like the way to go and it's like it's very brutal to watch but it's like you can i mean there's a difference between shitting on them and like you know and having playfully fun with them. roasting them yes yes know? big difference yeah huge difference and and i'm like dude what what is the point like what do you gain from this mm-hmm. and like i have made i always make the distinction like uh, oh my god he said this on stage, I cannot believe it. I'm like, it's not real. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing that goes on up there. He's not. He's not. He's not making legislation up there. He's mm-hmm. not. He's just speaking into a microphone, and now it just, it just fizzles into the air. Nothing else happens. What it is, it's like I think it's also people's naivety to what comedy is. They'll watch a, a well-known comedian like a Chappelle or or, mm-hmm. or, or a Kevin Hart. That's one of the comedians that we're talking about. And they'll see them in their act where, yeah, they get a freedom of, like, of talking a little bit more because they've proven their voice. Yeah. 
people know that they can trust what this gentleman is or, or woman is about to say on stage because they the crowd trusts that what they're going to do is at least bring it to a place of humor. Mm -hmm. they've, they've proven their voice. But then you have like people who are either like just getting into comedy or people that are in the crowd that think they know comedy because they've seen that shit. It's like the person you're watching on stage right now is not – Dave Chappelle, like you, you are not Chappelle. Stop trying to get on a soapbox. Fucking be funny and get the crowd laughing. That, that, that's your, that's like, your only job. Just be funny. You know, like, so, like I've noticed that like a big boom recently. Like we were talking about actually before we started recording of people like virtue signaling. Yeah. This the stage has ceased to be a stage with some people and it's become more of a soapbox. There is a poetry slam five places down the block at the coffee shop. You can go over there if that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. We're trying to work on jokes. We're trying to work on humor. We're trying to work on our craft right now. We don't need you with your fucking abortion and political standpoints. Yeah, if you want to go speak your truth, yeah. then there's a place for it. Yeah. Do you yeah. want to be woke? Go somewhere else. Like, yeah. It's just, that's, that's the thing I can't say. If, if like, who said it? Uh, Christopher Titus said it. He goes, he's like, look, I'll listen to your problems. Just make it funny. Mm -hmm. I said it's comedy at the end of the day like, like we're all writing from personal experience we're writing from personal uh, uh, views of the world it's not a fucking attack on people no I mean just cause you're on stage just me like you know ah, this should be done and this should be done and fuck these people no. it's like no you're we're not a comedian not a office. senator you're not running for office you're just just the whole point is just to make people laugh and like, oh, that, that, that's kind of funny. That's mm -hmm. it. That's all you got to do. Mm -hmm. That is all you got to do. And what's funny do. is that's like, that's it, the, the ironic part about like, you know, go back to what we're saying where we are our own worst critics. We'll have a show where like majority of the crowd had a great time, but we'll be pissed off about this one asshole that we're talking about on the podcast right mm. now. You know what I mean? It's, it, it's, yeah. it's such, I don't even know why we subject, like this is where you know that like if a person is doing comedy consistently and is still in it after like years on end, they love it. Oh, yeah. You have to have a passion for this because this will chew you up and spit you out. And not just in comedy, the entertainment business in general. You know, that's where like people like the most common question I think that like I get asked lately because, you know, I'm, I, I consider myself very blessed to be able to do three different things with, you know, do, being a stand up comedian and being an actor and working in pro wrestling. Uh, they ask me all the time, like, how do you do all that? It's like you'd be surprised how similar. Like, like it, it's all the entertainment industry. It's all dealing with bookers. It's all trying to deal with the politics of it. Like the best... I think uh, like when people were like uh, like a newer a newer kid that was thinking about getting into comedy came up to me recently. He's a, he's also a pro wrestler. He wants to start doing comedy so he can get better at his promos. Sure, which is you know that's I that's I, totally I, I, I would totally respect that. A lot of wrestlers won't do that shit. Mm -hmm. And he was like, uh, you know, what's you know how, how how can I like you know like really like break it like what's some good advice that like you that you could give someone who's like trying to like do like both things. And I gave him the same advice that I was given uh, recently by a gentleman by the name of Danny Cage. He's the owner of Monster Factory in uh, Paulsboro, New Jersey, and he's also the operations manager for Ring of Honor Dojo. Uh, he tells all of the students that this uh, this will get you the job, but this will help you keep it. Mm -hmm. How many people have we seen come into it that got all that passion, all that fire, all that like determination in their heart to like, I'm going to be the next big thing in this. And then they're gone in like two, three years. Yep. Because this game will fuck you up up oh, here. It will. It, if you, it will. If you are not prepared for the lumps and bruises that are going to come, I, it, it will destroy you. I actually yeah. I was even telling my girl the other night, I had to stop myself from going on, going on Facebook. Because you see how delusional everybody is like, uh, uh, on oh, social media. Everything's yeah. like, this is going to be big. It's like, yeah, we get it. Everything you do is big. Uh, everyone's so like grandiose, but it's like they don't – none of you are ever sharing your failures. Mm -hmm. We can't act like everything's all fucking peaches and cream. Yeah, you know what always I mean? You always got to put the highlights out there. You always got to put, like, you know, the happy, enjoyable it's moments. It's bullshit. Like, that's kind of why, like, I've backed off on social media a lot. Like, everyone, like, uh, I've got, I get messages from followers on, on, on Instagram that were like, you don't post, like, at all. Like, you do, where's the sketches? Where's the memes? Where's this? Where's that? And I, I tell them, like, you want the truth? I got burnt out by this shit. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the person that I was becoming on social media because I felt like I was two different people. All right. I don't win all the time. It's not always fucking yay positivity. It's like it doesn't always work out like that. Okay. Like yeah. the, the ever since you know uh, like uh, you know I'm very fortunate to have a, 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 a feature film be on the film festival circuit right now, and it's opening a lot of doors. But I'm also having a ton of doors slammed in my face on a daily basis. I have gotten so many no's recently. It's like literally look. I had to go out for a, for a gig that was like they wanted somebody with an edgy look. I was told my look was too edgy. Uh, 
to get all the like I, I've been in this casting process for over a month <laughs> only to be told oh no it's it, it was edgy but just a little too edgy I've been told that I've been told not tall enough I've been told too short I've been told uh, not enough muscle mass not enough lean muscle mass uh, uh, not a long enough beard I was told not a long enough beard were they, they were the ones ZZ Top were they <laughs> that, that's, there was one time like there was uh, there was one I was told. You were, you were probably our best reading, but we just decided to go another route. And that was all I was. So why even bother prefacing it with that? I was the best. So what was done that I like, they don't tell you any, like the, it will completely rip you to shreds mentally. Yeah. So if you see somebody that is in this game, don't fucking go out of their way to explain to them what you didn't like, or, or, or try to like chastise them, give them a pat on the back. Let them know what they did do well, then transition into yeah. Here's you what know, I like. You know what here's I'm saying? What I didn't. Like, be a little more cordial. Like, we're putting ourselves so out there. It's not like a band where you've got the lead singer and the bassist and the guitarist and the, the keyboardist and the drummer and like this one can cover for that one's fuck up. You drop the ball yeah, on stage. It's, it's, it's just you. It's all you. It's just you. You know. It, 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 so it's like this is it, it's a it's a brutal thing. You know, I don't want to make it seem like we're martyrs, like we're putting ourselves oh, through oh, hell yeah. for their entertainment. <laughs> we're, we're so brave. But it's just, I just wish people would just kind of just take take a step back, put yourself in, in in the performer's position, and it's like, if do you do this also? Oh, you oh you don't. Oh, okay then. <laughs> yes, you know, actually, I was in um, I was in New York uh, last summer, and um, myself and, my, and uh, Miguel Perez, mm-hmm. who I'll also be having on this pretty soon. Uh, we Great did guy. this. Uh, we did the NBC casting thing, mm-hmm. which is brutal. Oh yeah, Here, here's a little inside information on the NBC casting thing. It's he- it's a uh, once a year, and it's held at the Gotham, and mm-hmm. which is already like a huge one of the deal. most prestigious clubs. Yes, and here's the catch though. Um, there are multiple catches, but one of them is you get one minute, and how can you be funny in one minute? Yep. Like you, I mean, you'll be lucky if you get maybe three, three, maybe you sort of stand a chance mm-hmm. maybe but one i mean that 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 is almost impossible and when i well, looked at like there's like five people on the panel all of them like casting agents and you know uh this person's from like uh th- like this show or this network mm-hmm. i'm like oh, okay and they're all white women <laughs> i'm like huh? you're fucked like, right there's off like the four bat. white four <laughs> white women and like one soy boy looking motherfucker and that's soy <laughs> Just some, you know, <laughs> some whipped <laughs> peasant looking guy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay. Like, and I remember it was a, a diversity thing. I'm mm-hmm. like, okay, I think I've got a diverse look. Sure. I mean, there aren't that many, I mean, other than the person sitting in front of me. Yeah. I mean, there aren't that many people that look like me. I mean, jacked, you know, tattoos, beard, glasses, and can do comedy. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if, if they want like some funny biker looking guy, sure. And like, you know, how many people can do that's that? That's the thing too. You don't, you don't know what they're looking for at yeah. that particular co- call that day. And, uh, you no, have no you idea. Don't. I'm here to showcase me. And if this is something you're looking for, great. If not, eh, mm-hmm. okay. But then I look at the people. It's like, oh, like, you know, somebody that moves on. Like, but they weren't funny. Yeah. Comedy auditions might be the most brutal of yeah. all auditions. Auditions and contests mm-hmm. are, yeah. Well, contests, I think it's more like that's, uh, I don't think it's so much brutal. Uh, like, because contests, it's still stage time. So it's like, I'm still working on yeah, my craft. That, that, that's like, that's how I feel like you kind of have to look at contests because there's so much politics. You got to take them out with a grain of, grain of salt. Yeah. It, it's, look at it as stage time and, you, and you're fine. Yep. If you start looking at it like, I'm going to fucking win this shit right now. And then when you don't, <laughs> you feel like a piece of shit. Yeah. It's, like, it's yeah. all riding on this. I've, all I, my hopes and dreams are riding. I was I was part of a contest. Got got. I I will not mention the club because I'm not trying to throw stones because everyone's got their own way of doing shit. But when they announce the winners, and the crowd boos the winners Mm -hmm. because everyone was expecting another name to be said, like that's where you just like after I saw that that night I was like, all right, contests are a totally different animal. Yeah. So I just whenever I do them, it's thank the booker for the stage time. You know, Mm -hmm. if if you advance, fucking hey, congratulations, you were the you were funny that night. Because you never know what the crowd is going to be looking for in, in, in the humor, uh, and you, especially if they leave it up to the crowd to 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 advance the comic. Whoever brought the most people is moving on. That's you know what I mean. Always how it works. So, uh, but yeah, it's it, it, comedy auditions. I think may be the most brutal because in acting, you know, you, you're you're literally handed what to say. Yep. Totally different. Like Cold read. I can't fuck that up. <laughs> you yep. know what I mean? 
I just it's it's all about whether or not my delivery is what they were looking for. Yeah. Uh, you know, even like even pro wrestling uh, auditions because those do exist. They call them tryouts. You know, but it's an audition tryout. However, you want to look at it, they're looking to bring you onto the roster. You'll have your match. You at least get some sort of critique. So you know, you know, like you know, all right, we liked this, we didn't like that. Why do you do this? Why did you not do that? There's at least some you get something out of it. With comedy auditions, you get, like you said, one one minute. I've seen as most as two and a half, three minutes. But nine times out of ten, it's just the panel. It's not like you're doing it in front of a crowd. No, you know what I mean. Yeah, you're doing and the it other for- con- and it's all comedians, so everyone's working on their on their shit. So it's not like people are taking time to watch your set. And the panel is just the most deadpan thing in the world mm-hmm. because they're not there to laugh. No, exactly. they're there to literally rip your material apart. And see, so even if you get a, that's about as good as it gets. That yep. little, like it's so you leave there being like, did I even just do good in that? Like, yeah. it's it's so nerve wracking. Yeah, I remember when I did it, um, going into it, I was like, I mean, watching like you know, other people, they're not, then it's my turn. Like watching other people go up, I'm looking around, it's okay, they're making some of the other comedians laugh, but like that panel, they're just stone faced, just mm-hmm. like yeah. making notes, it- making notes. And, and that's the other thing too. You see them write, and you're like, "Fuck, what did they just write down?" Like it really takes you like out of yeah, your thought process. Like, like did it, was that joke not good enough? Am I not good enough? Do I, like <laughs> why, why? Why do I? It goes from thirst stand for up, your approval. Yeah, it goes from stand up <laughs> Lady to meltdown. Lady who's trying to make my dreams come true. You know, which that is actually sometimes beautiful to watch too. When a comic just finally just snaps and they have that meltdown <laughs> oh, on stage. Oh yes. Because like from like a comedy standpoint, you, you know what just happened. You like the crowd is like, oh my god, well, how could they be talking to us like this right now? But like as a comic, I'm backstage like he lost it. <laughs> like because it is, it's like almost like it, it's a beautiful disaster. Yeah. Because you know that that's like something that's been building up in the comedian for like so long and oh, then yeah. this was just the crowd that was like all right one heckle too much and you're just getting everything from the last month of shit shows that i've been doing and it just happens all on stage uh-huh and it's a, <laughs> and some and sometimes it is beautifully funny i think one of my favorite meltdowns i still tell him to this day brad pierce mm-hmm. with the night that he went to uh go into new york i'm pretty sure it was at gotham or it might have been levity he goes there for for a set and who shows up right before he's about to go on stage? Jerry Seinfeld. Oh. So for sure, Brad's getting held off on stage now. As Jerry Seinfeld is on stage, Jim Gaffigan walks in. So oh. now Brad was just about Good. to go up oh, on stage and now has to go up after Jerry Seinfeld and Jim Gaffigan. And ladies and gentlemen, for those of you watching this podcast, go on YouTube, type in Brad Pierce, and watch that set. Because I know Brad's jokes that was just him just losing his mind that two legends had just dropped in right before his set and he fucking crushed that crowd. Yeah. If he actually told any of his jokes, he would have lost the crowd. Just the fact that he was, not that his jokes are bad, but to riff off of the situation that just happened. And you know that as a comedian. Oh, of course. It's like, really? This is what I got to follow like, right we, now? Yeah. Like he goes up like, are we just going to ignore the fact that both Johnny Seinfeld mm-hmm. and Jim McGaffigan were just, just showed up on Just the right before you're about to go up. You were the next comedian, and they both did like a half hour. Yeah, they were like 20, 25 minutes. So like now you're now you're it's like, it's like freezing the kicker, you know what I mean? It like so now it's like it was just about to go do my five, and now I gotta wait another hour. Yeah. So it's like you know that whole time he's just like, what the fuck? It's like I've heard all these jokes in your shows. Come on! Like <laughs> and he just goes off, and it was a beautiful, beautiful meltdown slash comedy set. Yeah. <laughs> That landed well. Yeah, it yeah. did. I still tell them that. I'm like, dude, that was like literally one of the best sets I've ever seen you have. Yeah, because there have been times where somebody goes up there and like internally they just fall into the sunken place, mm-hmm. you know? But like, what they was just beautiful. Let their mind go. <laughs> and what was beautiful about that was, is it showed him that it was like, dude, you can riff. Like, you really yeah, can. Yeah, it was a learning and, it, and it's actually made him a stronger comedian because now when I see him host or I see him feature, he doesn't even, like, tell a joke for the first few minutes. He'll riff about what's going on, mess with the crowd, and then go into his jokes. Yeah. But he never did that before that night. Mm-mm. So it's like sometimes the meltdown is, like, a beautiful growth process. Yeah. You know? So it's like that's that's the thing. It's like there's so many, like, like in the entertainment industry, like, with, with what we do, it's so gruesome but it's also the most gratifying thing in the entire mm-hmm. world. And I think that that's why we do it. It's like we're ultimately addicts looking for our fix. And our fix is yep. that pop from the crowd, that reaction from the people, uh, because we work so hard to get it. 
Yeah, you know and I mean? it's because of those gruesome, awful, just cringeworthy moments make you appreciate those moments even more. Mm-hmm. Because you know, I, you put up with this, you put up with that, you put up with like, you know, bookers like you know, ignoring you for months, mm-hmm. sending emails, putting up with the politics of the whole industry. And even that can it can mind fuck you too. Yeah, because you, you know, you don't hear back from people. You're like, toll. did I do something? Did I upset somebody? Like, it, it's it can be very like a club that I've worked for years on end. And all of a sudden, I haven't worked there in over a year. Mm-hmm. But every time I talk to the guy, it's completely cordial. Everything's cool, but just bookings just just, don't coincide and it's like i hope i didn't i hope i didn't piss them off or or something like that like you really start to wonder those things even though you know you didn't do anything but you start to be like shit did i put out a facebook status that was like offensive to them yeah like the the thoughts that run through your mind and the and the self-doubt that goes along with it it's like you you really have to have a passion for this shit you do you really do and you can't let those things get to you either no because then you'll quit yeah you'll quit yeah if you quit then it's like you know then game over. And that's kind of where I'm at now. It's like, I'll, I'll open it. There's plenty of days where, like, where I, you know, I wake up and I just don't want to. I'm not going to act like every day I wake up and I'm like, let's tackle the entertainment industry. Like, no, it's, it, it can be draining. Uh, and there are plenty of days where like, I, just, I just don't want to do it. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's that thrill, I think, of, of, of like the chase where like you know that you, you know that you've got what it takes, but it's like you just got to keep going through the motions and the bullshit yep, and the yep, constant yep. grind. And I think that's why we see so many people like come and go. Cause, yeah, yeah, you see somebody, oh, they're on top of their game, then they just get burnt, burnt down. They're like, yeah, this isn't. Because it's very easy to burn out, man. It it's re- so it really easy to is. burn out. If you re- think, realize, oh, this is what's required, mm-hmm. then. But I, I, but I have noticed that since backing off on social media and focusing on actual life, it's not as uh, as draining. Oh yeah, like, I mean uh, yeah, social media. I mean, it's I have a dark, a, I have a dark hate, rabbit hole. To go I have down. a love hate relationship with social media. I love mm-hmm. it because you know it gives you, lets you connect with people, and lets you like you know put your stuff out there, which is great. But I hate the fact that people take it with with such value, and mm-hmm. like you know they feel validated through social media, and they vicariously live their lives. Don't. And, oh, you got 100,000 followers on Instagram. Good for you. You still work at Verizon. Shut up. Yep. Yeah, and I always think, like, you know, the people that make the film the comments section on YouTube. I mean, Joe Rogan talks about this a lot. Oh, God, that's the most brutal of, place in the world. What kind of fucking loser <laughs> actually <laughs> comments on a YouTube page? Yep. I mean, it's no different than, like, you know, on a Facebook. Con- I mean, you know, I guess it is a little bit different. Like, here's what I think about this person. Mm-hmm. And you expect it to, like, you know, push the needle one way or the other. One of my it f- doesn't. It's just no. Just it a doesn't. waste of ones and zeros. One of my, uh, that's a great, I like that. A waste yeah. of ones and zeros. I like that. I think one of my fa- my favorite uh, breakdowns of that was an interview with Bo Burnham. I mean, obviously, being a comedian, we all know that the term bitter, uh, don't bitter about Burnham, you know, uh, there's plenty of people that feel like he didn't, you know, he didn't do it the right way. You know, he came up through social media. You know, he went from YouTube to selling out clubs. He didn't do open mics and all that shit. It's like, so if you couldn't have bypassed all that bullshit, you wouldn't have done it either. But he was asking, uh, someone was asking him about, like, how do you respond to, uh, you know, hecklers in the crowd? He goes, I came from YouTube. There is nothing that anybody out there is going to say to me that I haven't already read in my YouTube comment section. Yeah. He goes, if you, he goes, if you really think you want to like try a shot at this, just go put out a couple of videos. And if you can get through the comments, you'll be all right. Yeah. Because if people are brutal, because there's no, there's no face to face. There's no, there's no consequence for their, for their words. They can just be like, fuck this guy. He's a loser. And they get to go back to their, <laughs> go to the loser. It's like, what did you gain from that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like what you happened? just showed is, what a jackass cause, you are. Cause or effect here. Yeah. There, there, there's Nothing. none. And that's, that's the part, like, the keyboard warriors are, are so, like, out of their fucking minds. And that's why I, that's, I had to, like, detach from, like, social media. Because it, 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 it will, that will mind fuck you worse than any audition or any sort of shit will. Mm-hmm. Just to take it for what it is. It's a marketing tool. If you're involved in some sort of entertainment industry, use it as marketing and move on. Connect with people if they're cool with you. But most of the time, dude, become friends with that block button because it's not worth the bullshit. Yep, 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 yep. Because most of them are just, like, you got the... Uh, I forget what they're called, but like trolls. You yes, get the people trolls. that literally are just saying shit just for the sake of pissing people off. Mm-hmm. Why? Why? 
It's it's a waste of time. It's like is that is that what you, the, the, those yeah. are the one, those ones we're talking about earlier the comics who think shitting on people is comedy and it's like but that's why like there's actually a petition to shut down Twitter because of how toxic it has become. <laughs> I, I would not lose any sleep. I mean I barely touch Twitter. I mean no. I maybe posted like one thing today. No. I'm like I'm I'm not like invested that much mm-hmm. power into and it, it happens with me and it, like uh, there's plenty of times where like I have to like take my phone and be like I I, I just can't respond to that but you know, I'll be walking around my apartment for two hours like who the fuck this guy think he is yeah. it's like it's he's just an asshole you got you, you like it's you have to like accept that type of shit if you're gonna be involved in the entertainment business that means that you have the opportunity to potentially make it to the limelight and if you can't even deal with the type of bullshit that comes along with not being in the limelight yet mm-hmm. you're gonna you're gonna crash and burn once you're in there yeah but if you can't if you can can handle it, then step aside and you know make room for somebody who can. Mm-hmm. And I and I, I'm still very much a nobody in this business. Oh. I, like I'm I'm gracious to have done the things that I've done, and and even then, you know, so like I still like see it for what. It, so I can only imagine what the hell it must be like up at the top. Oh, you know what I, I mean? mean? If you can imagine, like, I mean, it, I ain't gonna lie, I want to be there. Yeah. But <laughs> it's a, it's a grueling path to get there. Yeah, I mean, just think about like I would bring up Kevin Hart again. I'm the just the avalanche of just you know trolls and hate and people these are people who think like they're not being trolls they're actually trying to like you know you know make it through to him and try yeah, that's like, the other the delusion that goes along with it that people like, genuinely believe I'm gonna believe. make it through to Kevin Hart I'm gonna make him see things from my perspective mm-hmm. and yeah, 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 yeah. And it's like, dude, you're, you're just some guy. Mm-hmm. You're just some guy that beep, 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 beep. And it's like, I'm going to send this to Kevin Hart, and he's going to take what I say literally and connect with me. And it's like, no, he's just a, he's just a famous comedian. Mm-hmm. He has he doesn't have to work another day in his life if he doesn't No, hell no. To. But he continues to do that. And it's like, do you think like your little words are actually going to have some sort of lasting impact on this guy? Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just he's just got this tidal wave of just comments after comment after comment. And it's like, is, is this it? Like, is this your, the extent of your bravery? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah tweeting is so brave. So brave. So brave. So a, brave. That's a, that's a, like, most people, when, like, a, that's the thing, like, the, uh, you know, now that we're kind of, like, spawning into the, the shit show that is social media, uh, I love that when people are just, like, they, they just share a link and they're like, I've helped the cause. Yep. It's like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. You didn't do shit. <laughs> you didn't do a goddamn you thing. You didn't put a burger in that You didn't donate anything. Mouth. You didn't even know this cause existed. You read a headline, hit share, and pfft. All right, yeah, yeah that, I'm that a social whole, justice warrior. Yeah, the whole uh, bring back our girls. It's like, you're not doing anything. Yeah. <laughs> you just like post a thing. You put a hashtag. I'm helping. This is the comment. Yeah, there's a guy. Nobody's on, proactive anymore. Yeah, there's a guy on Instagram called uh, Made by Jim Bob who just makes fun of just... There's just social media and people's delusions over it. Mm-hmm. And just says a picture of like somebody on his phone. And he's like, this is the comment that changes everything. Send. <laughs> it's like that, that's the delusion. I think it just summarizes the delusion of social media and people, mm-hmm. you know, people's ideas of what it, they can actually do. Can you imagine what must happen to a person when they get like the top comment on a thread where they get like all those likes? Like they must just get like, oh my God, I did it. Yeah. I broken through. It's like, no, <laughs> I like, really haven't. I've gone viral three times. I still got to go to work tomorrow. You yeah. Know? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, now what? Yeah, because it's 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 never it's never ending, Mm-mm. and that's the what people believe what it takes to to re well you know we're talking about getting to the top what people think getting to the top through social media is as opposed to what getting to the top actually is. There's such a disconnect there. It really is. But, but uh, speaking of like reaching a, the end, I think we've about reached the end of this podcast. I was actually just you know it was funny. I was just about to ask you how long we've been talking because oh, no, like you know no, we're talking about what a grind no, it, this is. It goes by fast, doesn't it? Oh, oh it, it does because that's the thing. Like I, I appreciate you having me here today, but like I got to be honest. Uh, this is where uh, the grind can like become an issue, and like this is where like I kind of tend to drop the ball sometimes. Uh, oh, you know, yeah. Today, you know, thank God I have a woman by my side who who uh, believes in everything that I do. I don't know what I would do without her. But today is her birthday, yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> and here she is. She's been on the road with me all weekend. I've had three gigs this weekend, and here she is with me today. So uh, we're gonna go enjoy some city time in 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 Boston and go see some family. So uh, yeah, I think this would be a perfect time to, to wrap it up. So right. yeah, so might as well do that. Birth- wrap- Birthday shout out. Love you, Liani. Thank you for all your support, Happy baby. Happy lady. Now, before we wrap it up, tell people how people can get in touch with you on social media. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I love how that just circles around. We have to now we just shit on social media and now Drop I gotta plug those it. Promos. <laughs> well played, sir. You know what? And now you know how I'm actually very happy. Like, like this year I launched an official like I've always had a website, but this year I actually like launched it and it's like yeah. a real, like official looking thing. So Derek K. Moore uh, Beautiful. That, that's got links to everything on there that I'm doing right now. And also please check out the wrong Todd.com. It's a feature film that I've been that I I'm a part of and is uh, doing very well on the film festival circuit right now. Uh, we are in Phoenix, Arizona this month. Uh, next month, we finally get to premiere in our home state of Rhode Island. And I'm only allowed to share that much information with the film at this point. Beautiful. But wrong Todd.com. Get us on social media and be a lot of cool things coming out with that film. Excellent. And Thank you for having me, Tony. I appreciate you, brother. You got it. And before we end, if you ever want to find out more about me and where I'm going to be at, follow me at TonyTellJoke.com. And you can find me on Twitter and or Instagram at TonyTellJoke. In the meantime, see you all next week.